Emily growing up was always very independent, always really sassy, always marched to the beat of her own drum. She was always like challenging, but always like really fun to be around. She was always witty, always had the good comebacks, making everyone laugh. Her freshman year adjusting, um, she had some trouble and she started using uh, hard drugs and we had to send her to rehab in the middle of the school year and um, she came through that good um, and then stayed off of the hard drugs as far as I knew and then her sophomore year she started smoking marijuana again and then it led to the synthetic drug that she started smoking. She was pretty like chill and relaxed and calm in her life and seemed happier. And then all of a sudden her mood had flipped to where she had anxiety and she wasn't able to make it through a school day. She was having to come home in the middle of the day. She was having a really hard time even getting out of bed. I remember like she wouldn't even make it to the bathroom to throw up. She was throwing up every day, but she was just opening her window and sticking her head out the window and throwing up from her bedroom. Um, and it was like black chunks of stuff. Um, and she wasn't really eating. Uh, she wasn't getting along with me. She wasn't getting along with her boyfriend at the time. It was a Friday night and my husband and I were at work and we got a phone call from her boyfriend and he said, you know, Emily's not acting right. And I said, well, you know, give her her migraine medicine, let her go to sleep. He said, okay. Um, and then he called back again and said, she's like, making up some words and she's not talking right and she's bouncing over into the walls. I had my son come over and check because he was closer. He's older than Emily. And um, I had him come over and check and he, he called me and said, no, she's fine. She's sleeping. I don't know what he's talking about. And then it took only about 10 minutes later until he called me back and said, uh, you need to come home now. She's screaming at the top of her lungs, saying words that aren't really words, not making sense. Um, she's banging into everything. She's throwing stuff. Um, and she's going to hurt herself. And I said, you need to hang up with me and call 911. When I got here, he was still on the phone with 911. She was again back in bed because she had been doing this on and off since he had talked to me like every 10 minutes she was getting up out of bed and having a fit and then passing out and then getting back up and having another psychotic fit and then passing out again. When they came in the house, it was five constables. It was four men and one woman. And, you know, they're all bigger, older men and the woman and the two EMTs coming in and they roll her over in her bed and try to like say, Emily, you know, do you know where you are? And she just started like screaming words that like I, they didn't make sense, like just noises or uh, repeating her boyfriend's name over and over and over saying she didn't want to wake up for school. Um, they couldn't get her to calm down. They couldn't get her to respond to them, to what they were saying. She started like fighting them and the EMTs were trying to give her a sedative and trying to get her into the ambulance. And I mean, it took all five of the constables to like physically hold her down, one on each limb and one on her head, restraining her in her bed so that they could uh, give her a shot to sedate her. When we got to the hospital, 
they had obviously seen things like this before. They labeled it as a drug overdose. They said uh, basically they were going to keep her there. And um, when she woke up in the morning, she'd have to go to a rehab center or psychiatric rehab center. And at that point, um, I was mostly just angry, angry and scared, but not scared scared because I didn't think she could die I wasn't at that time I didn't think that she could actually die from it as the minutes went by and then the hours and she in the hospital she stayed combative and she was biting the ER nurses um, thrashing around in the bed um, they had to have her tied down to the bed and um it was like a scene out of a horror movie that I didn't even think like could happen in real life. I didn't think you see those movies in horror films or thrillers and they look so fake, but here it was happening to my daughter. I just, I remember during her calm moments of like singing lullabies and just trying to calm her down but nothing was working. Finally, the doctors came in and said that they had to sedate her completely, like they had to put her into a coma for her own safety. We weren't allowed to talk to her in the room. We weren't allowed to talk in the room. We weren't allowed to touch her. It was a really dark room. She couldn't have any kind of outside stimulation. And um, she was like that for a, about two days, and that's when they showed us the pictures, of the scans of her brain. And um, they told us that the black parts were dead tissue. It was like 70% of her brain was black. Um, they told us that the tissue that was alive, that was still gray matter, was being killed by the black areas. And they told us if she did survive, um, she wouldn't get off the respirator because one of the areas in her brain that was affected was the part that um, is your natural instinct to breathe. And they told us that she wouldn't be able to move her arms and legs. They told us she wouldn't be able to eat on her own ever again. My... Um, Dad was in the room with us and he asked if she would know that we were in the room with her and they said no, she wouldn't even know that we were there. She would just be in the same state that she was, you know, asleep on her respirator and never conscious again. And um, they told us to really talk about it and think about it of what Emily's life quality would be. And you know, we talked it over with our friends and family and knew Emily wouldn't want to live like that. I knew I wouldn't want to live like that. And it seemed cruel and selfish to me to keep her alive like that. So on the Sunday morning with all of our family there, we. Uh, removed the respirator and took her off life support and um, the only thing that they kept her on was morphine to help her comfort level and she just held on she didn't die like they said um, she kind of was moving a little bit um, but not really um, as the hours went by, I mean, this probably 10 hours later and she was still alive and they said that, um, now it could take a few days. It could take five days. They weren't sure. I dozed on and off through the night and at one time, like early, early morning, maybe four in the morning. I rolled over and there were nurses and doctors standing around her 
and I stood up and her eyes were open and and I was just the first thing is I love you Emily and she whispered back I love you too and that was just like the most amazing moment ever the first few times were good and and then I started to get headaches and and I was throwing up yeah headaches and throwing up and um really bad anxiety yeah I would wake up in the middle of the night you know and, and like have to smoke it but I had an alarm on my phone you know that would wake me up she started therapy um, six hours a day. It was physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. At that point, she had a feeding tube that she had to have in her stomach to be able to eat. She, wasn't, she couldn't eat by mouth yet. Um, she couldn't use the bathroom yet. She had to wear adult-sized diapers, or as they called them, briefs. Um, she couldn't dress herself um, ever. The, AIDS would have to come in and do everything for her. She was just laying in the hospital bed. She couldn't even sit up on the edge of the bed by herself. And from there, they taught her how to eat again, how to swallow food. She had to learn um, how to sit up on the edge of the bed, um, how to be able to sit in a wheelchair. I cannot be alone, sadly. Um, like what, like any, any 16 year old or 20 year old would not, would not like to be in my situation. Being in a wheelchair, having no friends, like not being able to hang out with anybody. Yeah. Just having family. I mean, yeah. What else can I say? <laughs> Being confined to a wheelchair, losing your independence, losing all of your friends, losing everything, your future. There's no drug that's worth losing your future over. <sighs> Like the high isn't worth it, but, but if you do, if you do, like th this is what's gonna happen to you. This or, or death, I mean, like, like th those are both not good outcomes. It's just a really dangerous drug and you're playing with your life and you're playing with your family's lives and it's not worth that. <laughs>